Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the 14th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. After spending three or four weeks in the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, we go back into Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 7, and we see Jesus in a confrontation with the the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the experts in the law. And the, the center of this confrontation, this dispute, is what happens when the laws of men and the law of God collide. So that will be the focus of our worship this morning. Please join in singing our first hymn. It's printed for you in your worship folder, the morning hymn. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, if we claim to be without sin, Father, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only Son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and in the joy of your Holy Spirit let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. First lesson for this 14th Sunday in the season of Pentecost comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, 4, beginning at verse 3. Beginning at verse 1, excuse me. Um, Deuteronomy literally means the second law, or the second giving of the law. And, and in these words, Deuteronomy is repeating the covenant that God made with his people at Mount Sinai to a new generation. These, he would be speaking to the children of the people who died, who passed away as they were wandering in the wilderness. And he, he points out three pretty stark differences between the laws of man and the law of God. The, the first one is that the law of God doesn't change. In fact, in these words, God says don't add to it, don't subtract from it, don't change it, don't alter it at all. As we know, the, the laws of men, they're, they're constantly changing with, with different administrations and different lawmakers. The second difference is that the laws of men, they can only apply to outward behavior, right? There's no law that a man can write that can apply to the human heart, and yet the law of God is aimed directly at the human heart, to our, our thoughts and our, our, our feelings and, and the things that come from within. And the third difference is that, as we all know, uh, there are some really bad laws out there. For example, uh, the law that, that claims that two men or two women can marry or uh, Roe versus Wade. Those are terrible laws, and they're evil laws because the people who write them are evil. They are evil. But God is good to his very core. He is good, and his law is good, and that's why we will want to obey what he commands. So now, Israel, listen to the statutes and the ordinances that I am teaching you and carry them out so that you may live and so that you may enter the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving to you and take possession of it. Do not add to the word that I am commanding you and do not subtract from it so that you keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you. Keep them and put them into practice because in this way your wisdom and your understanding will be recognized by all the people who hear about all these statutes. And they will say, this nation is certainly a wise and understanding people because what other great nation is there that has a God as close to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call on him? What other great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances as righteous as this entire law that I am presenting to you today? But guard yourselves and guard your whole being diligently so that you do not forget the things that your eyes have seen and so that those things do not disappear from your heart all the rest of the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 119b, on page 110. Please note the instructions for who will sing which part of the, each stanza.
Our second lesson comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. Here Paul points out another difference between the laws of men and the law of God. Can you achieve righteousness by obeying the laws of men, at least in the eyes of other men, other people? Well, certainly you can. If you don't speed, you likely won't get a ticket. If you don't steal, you won't be arrested, and and so on and so forth. We, We can achieve a certain level of civil righteousness by obeying the laws of men. Does the same hold true for the law of God? Can we achieve righteousness in God's eyes by obeying His law? No, of course not. Not because God's law isn't good, but because we can't keep it. God didn't give us his law so that we might achieve righteousness by it, so that we might make ourselves right in his eyes by our obedience to it, but rather to lead us to understand we can't achieve it, our own righteousness on our own, rather to lead us to Christ. The, the gospel message then is this wonderful uh, flip of of the law's message. The law says you can't make yourself righteous before God. The gospel says, but God has given you the righteousness His demands through His Son. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who are not pursuing righteousness have obtained righteousness, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, while pursuing the law as a way of righteousness, did not reach it. Why? Because they kept pursuing it not by faith, but as if it comes by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion over which they will stumble, and a rock over which they will fall. The one who believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God on behalf of the Israelites is that they may be saved. Indeed, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but it is not consistent with knowledge. Since they were ignorant of the righteousness from God and sought to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness from God. For to everyone who believes, Christ is the end of the law, resulting in righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, number 286.
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We read selected verses from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the experts in the law came from Jerusalem and gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eating bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. In fact, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they scrub their hands with a fist, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions they adhere to, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, kettles, and dining couches. The Pharisees and the experts in the law ask Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? Instead, they eat bread with unclean hands. He answered them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching human rules as if they were doctrines. You abandon God's commandment but hold to human tradition like the washing of pitchers and cups, and you do many other such things. He called the crowd to him again and said, Everyone listen to me and understand. There is nothing outside of a man that can make him unclean by going into him, but the things that come out of a man are what make a man unclean. In fact, from within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual sins, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and make a person unclean. This is the gospel of our Lord. We pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Fellow reading friends in Christ Jesus, who is the great physician. If or maybe when you find yourself in the unhappy position of having to go see your doctor because you're so ill, because you're in such pain, what kind of doctor do you prefer going to? Would you, would you rather go to a doctor who is very kind, very gentle, very sensitive to your feelings and your opinions and your thoughts, but leaves you with a nagging impression that he's kind of just telling you what you want to hear. That even if, even if it is a very serious disease you're struggling with, he just says, oh, don't worry, it'll, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Or would you prefer to go to a doctor who is rather gruff and rough, who, who doesn't really care much about your feelings or, or what you think or what you looked up on WebMD and are trying to advise him about, but he is extremely focused, extremely concerned about about the tests that tell him what your diagnosis is, and he is, he is determined to find the proper cure, the proper procedure for you. About a decade ago, there was a TV show on, on Fox called House MD, and, and Dr. Gregory House was, was more like that second kind of doctor. He was gruff, he was rough, he didn't really care much about his parents' feelings. Instead, in fact, he preferred not even to meet with his patients at all. He would send his minions to go meet with them. He, he preferred to diagnose from a distance. But he was determined to, to find the proper diagnosis and to provide the proper cure. And in our text today, Jesus is a little bit like that Dr. House, a little bit gruff, a little bit rough, but very focused, very determined to, to make the proper diagnosis and to provide the proper, the only proper solution. If you ever watched that show, House MD, you know that Dr. Gregory House often found himself going against the establishment, going against the hospital administration that was over him. Uh, and he often found himself having to be an advocate for his patients, even when the hospital administration said, no, well, there's nothing we can do for you. We just have to get, get rid of you. We have to dismiss you. And in a sense, Jesus is doing the same thing here. He's running headlong into the establishment, into the, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the experts in the law who have come from Jerusalem. He's in Galilee right now. Who have come from Jerusalem to try to trip him up. It's kind of like a, an investigative force trying to, trying to find something to charge Jesus with, a, a sin, a crime to charge Jesus with. And it, it seems like they didn't have to wait too long that as soon as they observed their Jesus' disciples eating a meal, they observed, well, they didn't wash their hands before eating. 
They weren't concerned about hygiene. Mark tells us Gentiles why this was a big deal, why this mattered. You see, in, in the two to three hundred years before Christ, the, the Jewish leaders had created their own set of rules that, that kind of served as a hedge around God's Ten Commandments. It consisted of 613 additional rules that they placed around God's Ten Commandments. And, and washing your hands was one of them. And, and so the, the Pharisees and the experts in the law said, why don't, why don't your disciples do this? All, all, any other good Jew will wash their hands, not for hygiene purposes again, but but to make themselves ritually clean, to make them clean before God. And so they think they've, they've found some way to charge Jesus and his disciples to make him guilty under the law. Jesus del- delivers a pretty scathing rebuke, doesn't he? He says right to their face, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Isaiah talked about you guys, that, that you're a bunch of pretenders. That's what a hypocrite means. They were pretending to speak for God, to teach on God's behalf, and yet they were teaching as God's commandments the rules of men, rules that that their forefathers and they had just made up out of thin air. God has never commanded in the Old Testament that his people had to wash their hands to become ritually clean. Now, hygiene is a different matter. There's nothing wrong with that, but God had never commanded this to make them right with God. And Anyone or any church or any pastor who claims to speak for God but in fact is just speaking their own thoughts, their own ideas, their own laws is a hypocrite, is a pretender just like these Pharisees and experts in the law were. So for example, the Catholic Church does this when it forbids priests and nuns to marry. The, the Baptist does this when he says that it is a sin to dance or play cards or consume alcohol or smoke or, or go to the movies or any of the other uh, many cultural things that they forbid. The, the revivalist is doing this when they say, if you're really going to be a believer, you have to have a very emotional conversion experience and you have to actually... Make a decision for Christ. You have to invite him into your heart. The the charismatic leader does this when he says, I had a word from God last night, and this is it. And then he he just makes it up out of thin air. Do Lutherans do this? Do Lutherans teach the rules of men as if they were the commandments of God? Well, not in our official doctrine. You know what our official doctrine is, right? Scripture alone. We, we, our, our confession is that we don't add to, subtract from, or twist the Word of God. That is, our, that is our doctrinal statement. At the same time, it's easy to give the impression that, that God has said something when he actually hasn't. For example, if, if you get the impression that it is a sin to marry someone who is not a Lutheran, God never said that. If you have gotten the impression that it is a sin if you do not send your children to a Lutheran school, God has not said that. Now hopefully you've never heard those things spoken as something that God has commanded, but but if you have, understand that those are not God's commands, and we should not add to God's word. We should not teach the rules of men. Now now the things I mentioned that, that we may be guilty of, that's really good advice. That's really good guidance. Marry a Lutheran, send your kids to a Lutheran school, but it is not, it's not mandated by God. It is not commanded by God. So Jesus, Jesus sets out kind of a twofold defense against the Pharisees, against the, the religious establishment. And the first part that he attacks is their diagnosis. What was their diagnosis as they, as they looked at Jesus' disciples? Their hands are dirty, right? That's about as deep as it went. They, they didn't wash their hands before they started eating. And you know what that does? That makes sin just a superficial thing, just, just an outward thing, that it's, it's only about your behavior. It's only about what you do. You know, very much like I said before, can you become civilly righteous by obeying the laws of men? Yes, you can. If you keep the laws of our land, the the people around you will deem you to be righteous. You can establish a measure of righteousness there, but, 
but that doesn't apply before God. Their, their diagnosis was wrong. And then, so Jesus goes into their, their cure. Um, the cure was, well, why don't your disciples follow the traditions of the elders? And, and the cure for the diagnosis, the, again, the problem was dirty hands. They didn't wash their hands before eating. Well, the, the solution to that is very easy then, right? Wash your hands. That's a very easy solution. But again, you, when you have the wrong diagnosis, you're bound to come to the wrong Cure, and that is exactly what the Pharisees and the experts in the law had done. They had turned sin into something that is merely superficial, something that can be very easily solved. If, if your hands are dirty, wash them, and God will be happy with you. you know, this is the, the church or the churches that tell you, you just have to follow the right program, the right routine, the, the right guidelines. And if you do that, then, then you will be right with God. But that's a misdiagnosis and it's a, a poor cure, a totally inadequate cure. Now, after Jesus has rebuked the Pharisees, he, he turns to his actual patients, right? And here we see Jesus' bedside bat manner. He says, come to me, listen to me, listen up and understand. Now, if your doctor, if your uh, primary care doctor comes to you and says, all right, sit down. I got some serious things to tell you. And maybe at this time in, in our lives, in our world, uh, you know, maybe it would be especially meaningful for you to go to your doctor who's cared for you for years, maybe decades, and, and say, can you give me the straight answer on what this COVID stuff is all about? Can you give me the straight evidence, the science on the masks and the vaccines? Because you'd, you'd trust him, right? He's taken care of you for a long time. The Son of God is coming to us and saying, listen up. He's saying, listen up. This is the real problem. And now he gives us the right diagnosis. He, he, he bluntly, forcefully contradicts what the Pharisees' diagnosis was, right? He says, there is nothing outside of a man that can make him unclean by going into him. Well, that doesn't need just contradict what the Pharisees and experts in the law said. I would say right now in our world, in our society, it contradicts everything the world says. You know, the whole nature versus nurture argument. Why do people grow up and do bad things? Well, the world says it's got to be nurture. It's got to be the atmosphere in their home as they grew up. It's got to be the world around you that makes you evil, that makes you do wicked things. And so if you're abusive, that's probably because you were abused as a child. If if you are greedy, it's because you live in a materialistic, capitalistic society. If you're a miserable spouse, it's because you had miserable parents. And on and on it goes. If you're lustful, well, how could you not be? Look at the, the smut that's on TV and on the Internet. And you see what that does, right? It, it, it takes all the blame for the sins that you commit and, and places it elsewhere in different people, different situations, different things. Again, it makes it totally superficial. Just like dirt on your hands, it's easy enough to wash off. But Jesus gets to the truth. He gets to the true diagnosis about what's wrong with us and our relationship with God. He says, the things that come out of a man are what make him unclean. Outward factors, other people, they don't make you evil. Maybe they coax the evil that lives inside of you out, but they don't make you evil. They don't make you guilty before God either. Nothing outside of us can make us unclean before God. It is what is inside of us, in our heart, that makes us unclean before God and unfit to enter heaven. And here's the really scary part. Here's the part that should, should really terrify you, send a shiver up your spine. Jesus looks at the x-ray of our hearts, and this is what he sees. Evil thoughts sexual sins, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, unrestrained immorality, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. That's what's living in your heart and mine. You know, we look at some particularly bad criminals or some bad crimes and we think, how could anybody do that? What Jesus is telling us is that the potential, the capability of doing those very same things lives within each of us. Each of us could potentially be a murderer or unfaithful in our marriage or filled with deceit or any of the other things that 
that he mentions there. It's all right in our heart. And that's what makes us unclean before God. And that's where our text ends. <laughs> where do we go from there? Uh, you have nothing good living in you. God looks at the heart, and what he sees in your heart is only evil all the time. I suppose we could say amen there. But if you've been in other churches, uh, you might have, have heard the pastor do this when, when there doesn't really appear to be any good news in the text, any gospel. And you maybe think of it this way, that the pastor feels like he has to give an expert second opinion, you know, like doctors will give second opinions. And they kind of give the impression, well, Jesus doesn't really have any answers. He wasn't clever enough at this point to, to come up with any answers to, to your heart problem. And so here's, here's my second opinion. Here's the good news. The good news is that if you just pick up the right book, if you just go to the right seminar, if you just follow this 10-step plan, if you just have the proper mindset as you walk out those doors, if we can just make worship uplifting enough and motivate you enough and, and give you a smack on the butt as you walk out the door, you can overcome all of those evil things that are living in your heart. I don't think I'm the only one that's ever walked out those doors thinking I am really going to try hard to fight my sinful flesh right now and failed within minutes, if not hours. It doesn't work. And, and you understand what that is. If I were to give you a 10-step plan to defeating the, the evils that live in your heart, that's not gospel at all. That's just more law. That's man-made law. That is an inadequate solution. In the TV show, Dr. House always had the answer. Jesus doesn't appear to have the answer here. Because Jesus is the answer. That is the gospel here, that the one standing before us, diagnosing our wicked hearts, is the answer. Who Jesus is and what he did is the only cure for, for the, the terminal disease of original sin that we inherited when we were conceived. Jesus is the only answer, who he is and what he did. You see, he wasn't born like we are. He wasn't born contaminated right down to his very core with all of those evil thoughts because he wasn't born of two sinful human beings. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He didn't have any of those filthy inclinations in his mind or his heart. He never wanted to do any evil and therefore he never did any evil. He was perfectly clean. And this is the, the solution that we need, that Jesus was perfect. And while he was born under the law, he was born under God's commandments, obligated to keep them just as we are, he was not born under or sub to submit to the laws of men. And that's why he and the Pharisees always had these arguments, because the Pharisees were so fixated on, on their own laws that they totally cast aside God's commandments. Jesus refused to obey them. He broke them all the time. He didn't care much for their superficial man-made rules. And, and he didn't care because he knew two things about man-made rules. Two things that happen if you try to put the rules of man into the mouth of God. First is, you will make people feel guilty who have no reason to feel guilty. They were trying to make the disciples feel guilty about eating with unwashed hands when God had never said you can't eat without washing your hands. Secondly, what you end up doing is is providing a, a shield or a justification for people who really should feel guilty. And so the, the ones who should have felt guilty in this text are the Pharisees. But because they were not, they were breaking Deuteronomy 7, right? They were adding to the Word of God. They should have felt guilty over that, but they weren't. I'll use a, a modern day illustration to help you maybe visualize this a little bit better. You may have heard about what's called CRT, critical race theory, being taught not only in schools from kindergarten through college, but even in, in some of our biggest companies that's being propagated. It's a philosophy being propagated there. And it, it essentially establishes your value based on your skin color. And what ends up happening in the end is that People who have no reason to feel guilty for racism or discrimination are meant to feel guilty. 
You're meant to feel guilty just because of how much pigment you happen to have in your skin, even if you've never done or said a racist thing in your life. And the flip side of that is that critical race theory seeks to provide justification, uh, a shield, a, a reason that if you're of a different skin color, you have every reason, every justification to be filled with rage and violence and anger because you've been oppressed for so long, even if you've never been oppressed. You see what that does? It totally flips justice on its head. That even if you haven't done anything wrong, you should feel guilty. But if you're doing some things wrong because you've been oppressed, you are justified. It's totally backwards. And that's exactly what the Pharisees had done here. And it's why Jesus doesn't care about man-made laws. But he does care deeply about the law of God. And he kept it, every letter of it, perfectly throughout his life. He didn't need to wash his hands. He didn't even need to wash his heart. He was perfectly clean. Now, even that is not the gospel yet. Because if I leave you with just a perfect Jesus, the best you can take away is that you need to try a lot harder to be like Jesus. It's kind of like if you go to a doctor, he may be perfectly healthy. It doesn't help you very much if you are sick. On the TV show House MD, Dr. House cured many people using the appropriate diagnosis and the appropriate treatment. But there are a few things that Dr. House never did. He never took the, the disease, the pain, the suffering of his patients on himself. He never, he never did anything like that. He, he never suffered God's wrath for his patients. He never, he never took that cup of God's anger over our sin and just the fact that we have such filth living in our hearts and drank it down like Jesus did. He never went to a cross he never died for his patients, Dr. House never did. He never suffered the horrors of hell for his patients, but Jesus did all of those things. Jesus did all of those things as our substitute, and now, as we said in our confession of sins, his blood purifies us, cleanses us right down to the heart from all of our sins. Jesus is the only cure for what ails us. Our problem is so much deeper than having dirty hands or not having the right behaviors. Our problem is right there in our hearts with our wicked desires that we've had since conception. And the only cure for that is the blood of Jesus. The only thing powerful enough to wash those sins away is the blood of Jesus. I remember one episode of, of House MD, and there, I think there are a few like this where the call went up when he was in a room or there was one time he was on a plane and, and the, the cry went out when someone was sick, is there a doctor in the house? And it, Dr. House, he was always very grudging. He's like, leave me alone. I don't want to help you. I'm not on the, on the clock. But, but he would help. Uh, and the patient, the, the person who is sick, would be very relieved to have a doctor there to help them. Now, I don't, I don't see anyone throwing up on themselves in here. Hopefully none of you is getting extremely ill. I hope that's not the case. But... Let's ask a couple related questions. Are there any sinners in this house? What I mean by that is, is there anyone who has tried as hard as they can to scrub the guilt from their conscience, but they just can't do it? Is there anyone here who has noticed how, how strong the stream of filth flooding out of their heart is, and they've, they've tried their best to plug it up, but it, it feels like you're, you're trying to plug a leaky dam with one finger? Have you tried your best just to fail over and over again? Same sins over and over again. Have you tried your best to be a good parent and a good spouse and a good Christian and a good citizen, and yet you keep failing over and over again? Have you tried your hardest to follow whatever man-made rules to try to stem the flow of evil out of your heart and just kept failing? If that describes you, then then you need to hear the answer to this last question. Is, is there a doctor who can really help us? Is there a doctor who can do more than just give us a, a, a regimen of things we should do, a, a, a therapy session? Is there a doctor who can do more than just give us advice or be a role model for us? And 
The answer is right here, we have that doctor who doesn't tell us how to, how to heal ourselves, but actually offers himself as the cure. That's what these means of grace are all about. I hope you've, you've come to really appreciate the focus, the force of the means of grace. When you leave baptism, when a baby leaves baptism, they don't leave with a booklet of, okay, this is how you should live now as a baptized Christian. When you hear the absolution, your sins are forgiven isn't followed by, okay, you better not go out and do it again. When you receive the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament, you don't have to worry that there's some sin left behind. It's all washed away. These means of grace are not something for you to do. They are something Jesus does for you. And what he does is target the real root cause of your problem and your, your uncleanness before God, and that is your heart. These means of grace are carefully targeted treatment at your heart. And so you can leave here today knowing that you are clean. Jesus is pretty blunt in this text. There's no doubt about that. And so I'll be a little blunt here as we conclude. If you think that your problems are outside of you, if you blame your childhood, your parents, the people around you, the, the people you work with, if you blame the lousy drivers on the belt line for how angry you get out there, I don't have any answers for you. There's no solution in here if your problems are outside of you. But if you believe Jesus' diagnosis, that the real problem is within each of us, then I have the solution. Because here we have Jesus who comes to us through the means of grace to fix, to heal, to cure our sinful hearts. Praise be to Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the response on page 7 in your worship folder.
and ask the Sunday school teachers for the 2020, 20, 2021, 2022 school year to step forward to be installed. Dear friends in Christ, you have been called as teachers in the Sunday school of this congregation. You are doing the work the Lord has committed to his church, to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make disciples of all nations, and to feed the lambs of the Lord Jesus. You do this work on behalf of risen Savior Lutheran Church and in association with the parents who entrust their children to your instruction and care. Your work is both a great privilege and a serious responsibility. To equip yourselves for this blessed work, it is necessary that you faithfully study God's word, devote yourselves to prayer for those entrusted to your care, and carefully prepare for the lessons you will teach. It is also of great importance in the teaching of the Savior's little ones that you set an example by leading Christian lives. I now ask you in the presence of God and this congregation, are you willing to accept this responsibility and to do your work faithfully according to the ability God has given you? If so, answer yes, and I ask God to help me. Yes, and I ask God to help me. I now install you as teachers in the Sunday School of Risen Savior Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May God grant you his Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to his glory and for the good of his children. Members of Risen Savior, I urge you to regard these teachers as servants of Jesus Christ, teachers of the gospel and God's gifts to his church. Support them in their work, pray for them, and bring your children to Sunday school so that you and your families may receive the eternal blessings the Lord promises to those who hear and learn his word. Let us pray. Gracious Savior, you bless every effort to bring children up in the Christian faith. We ask you to give wisdom, kindness, and perseverance to teachers who feed your lambs. Teach them your truth, so that they may teach others. Cause the children entrusted to their care to be eager to learn about their Savior. May your goodness go out into all the earth, so that people in this community and everywhere may hear it and believe it. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord. May the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep return to your seats. Ask the congregation to please stand as the service continues on page 9. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. This morning we will offer up two special prayers. First of all, uh, Dave and Donna Lazaby are celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary today, so we thank God for the many decades that he has given them together, for blessing them with a, a healthy relationship, and that he would give them many more years together. Also, as you no doubt have seen, uh, the situation in Afghanistan is dangerous and scary even just to watch it on TV. Uh, there are many Americans over there who are in harm's way. There are service members who are putting their lives in harm's way. And there are Christians in Afghanistan whose lives are now in danger. You may have heard that uh, the Taliban and ISIS are going door to door and searching through people's phones. And if you happen to have a Bible app on your phone, there's a very good chance you could be shot dead on the spot. So we keep all of those people in our prayers. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants throughout the 68 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. 
O Lord, ruler of nations and savior of all people, we pray that you would look with mercy on the nation of Afghanistan in this moment of turmoil, unrest, and danger, both for the Afghani people and for the people of all nations, including our own, who are desperate to find safety and security in a very dangerous and unsecure place. We pray especially for our fellow citizens who are serving in our country's armed forces. Protect them as they discharge their duties and bring them safely back again to their homes and families. Lord, we also pray for all the Christians currently living in Afghanistan and who are now fearful for their lives because of their confession of Christ as the dark forces of evil rise up in war against your Son and all who follow him. If it is your will, spare their lives that they may continue to confess Christ in a nation that desperately needs the light that only he can provide. But if it is your will that they should be martyred for their faith, keep them firm to the end and bring them safely to their true home at your side in heaven. We boldly bring these petitions to your throne of grace and power, trusting that you will hear us for Jesus' sake, our Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger, and in all we do direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn number 288. 